follow in the Bible, we're going to 1 Chronicles 22, 5. Now remember, we talked about the fame and the honor of Jesus fulfilling this prophecy. We talked about the fame and the honor of the 12 apostles and the early church fulfilling this prophecy. It says, the Lord's house shall be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all countries. Throughout all countries. Not just the Jewish nation, but every nation. And I will therefore now make preparation for it. We saw how miracles should be a normal part of the magnificent church. See, God created everything out of nothing. Enoch didn't die. Miracles have been going on ever since God began creation. Noah and seven others were saved from the flood with the animals. The axe swam in the Bible. The fiery furnace didn't burn the three Hebrew, Hebrew children, neither, neither did the lions eat Daniel. Jesus and his apostles did miracles and healings consistently. We also found that it is built by foreigners, aliens, illegals, or in other words, not so perfect individuals. And that ought to help you. <laughs> being that we're not so perfect along with God's chosen people now many Christians and denominations today have reduced the Bible to one word and that word is faith basically it is their faith but like the Muslims the Hindus the Confucius the Buddhas the animists and all the other religions when we only have to believe and get all the rewards, we're getting something for nothing. See, when I don't have to straighten my life out, when I don't have to repent, when I don't have to confess my sins and confess Jesus is God and Jesus is the Savior and I don't have to be water baptized, what we're saying is I'm getting something for nothing and that's exactly what all the man-made religions offer. Something for nothing. You just follow them and you're in. <clears throat> we can't reduce the Bible down to one word of faith. It's just part of God's word. That's a welfare mentality when we want something for nothing and it cripples the power of the Bible. <clears throat> now, this temple that God is talking about in 1 Chronicles had to be built according to the pattern shown you on the mount, that's Moses' tabernacle, and Solomon's temple in 1 Chronicles 28.11, David gave to Solomon the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. Both Moses' tabernacle, Solomon's temple, had to be built by the pattern that God gave. They couldn't just do what they wanted to do. And we got to understand that. The magnificent house that God is building must be done His way. The Bible is twisted like our Constitution by people. Let's look at the First Amendment of the Constitution. All right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. They can't set up a religion. They can't respect one religion over another. Neither can they make a law prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. So not only as we as United States citizens have the right to speak freely, but the church has a right to preach the gospel. Now, People say that this nation was not built on Christianity. But let me just remind you that Congress, it was Congress that passed a law that the Bible would be printed and suggested that it be taught in schools. It was Congress 
that decided to pass out 10,000 Bibles to the soldiers in the Revolutionary War. They didn't pass out 10,000 Hindu books or any other religious books. It was the Bible. It was Congress that passed a law at the same time that said we've got to have chaplains for every two regiments there's got to be a chaplain. Those chaplains were Methodists, Quakers, Presbyterian, Baptists. They were. Muslim, Buddhists. Are you there, church? See, we've got to understand people are twisting the Constitution to their own benefit and America's destruction just like they twist the Bible. And we have got to wake up to these things. It was Congress. And, and the Bible wasn't taken out of public school and prayer wasn't taken out of public school. When I was a boy, we prayed in public school. And we were taught scriptures in public school and we sang songs, Christian songs, in public school down south in Kentucky, in the Appalachian Mountains. The Bible and prayer wasn't taken out until 1962. So up to 1962, the Bible was an accepted book. And remember lawyers in the beginning of our nation, up until Abraham Lincoln, they had to know the Bible to become a lawyer. I don't know if you're aware of that. And so these people that say that, you know, it wasn't founded on the Bible, it wasn't founded on Christianity, they're lying to you. These people are lying to you. Now, in 1962, Congress made a new religion. They recognized and respected a new religion, and that religion was the religion of secular humanism. And the religion of atheism. The Supreme Court back then said that atheism was a religion. And the humanists say they have the new religion of secular humanism. And our government, which is not supposed to identify any religion, they respected the atheists and the humanists. And in doing so, they prohibited the Bible. And those who followed the Bible in America, they threw out Jesus and the Bible. Do you understand that? They violated this constitution. But what did they do? They twisted it. They started in about 1948, twisting it and saying, separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. We got to be, government's got to be protected from the church. No, it's the opposite. The church is protected from government. That's the truth. But see, when you repeat a lie enough, people start believing it. And just like they twist the Constitution, people are twisting the Bible around. And we don't have magnificent churches anymore. As the prophecy said last week, you go to one church and it's different than the next church. Every church is different. When we should be like the Toyota car, when you buy it in China, or you buy it in Africa, or you buy it in America, it's the same product. Are you with me? But we have got to get the vision for God's way, God's pattern, and do it His way, whether we like it or not. We've got to change this thing. Second Chronicles 5.13 now remember, the temple had a door, which is Jesus. It had an altar where the blood was shed for the cleansing of sin. That's the cross. It had a labor, water baptism. It had a lampstand. It had a table, communion. And it had an altar of incense, prayer and praise. And it had a holy of holies where God dwelt. But they had built all this and they put everything together. The Lampstand was there, the communion table was there, the altar of incense was there, the Ark of the Covenant was there, the mercy seat was there, the temple was built beautiful. Everything was great. They had a magnificent natural building. But nothing had happened. Nothing spiritual had happened. 
Then we get to 2 Chronicles 5.13. It came to pass as the musicians and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. You see, it came to pass when this happened, not the natural part of the building, not the symbolic part of the building, but when they started praising God with musical instruments, when they lifted a little voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, then, then, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The presence of God came and filled the house of God, and the ministers could minister anymore because God himself was ministering. And that really intimidates a lot of ministers and a lot of song leaders. When God shows up, it intimidates them. It threatens them because they got to do their show, you know. They got to put on their, their you know, finest ex presentation. But when God comes up, we don't need you, my friend. And ministers won't step aside for God to touch people today. But the key here, they had everything, the door, the labor, the water baptism, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the door. They had everything in the tabernacle but the glory, but the presence. And when they began to praise and sing and minister unto him, then God came and filled the temple. And the ministers had to step aside. Hallelujah. Now, folks, that's when it became a magnificent house. When the magnificent one came. You can have nice furnishings all you want. You can build crystal cathedrals and all kinds of fancy buildings. But that thing is nothing until God shows up. He's the magnificent one of the magnificent house. Hallelujah. Very powerful. After following the pattern, God came, including praise and worship unto him. Romans 5, 15, 4 says, Things written aforetime were written for our learning. Whose learning? Ours. This tabernacle was built and written about so we could learn from it. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, These things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Are we in the end of the ages? Yeah, Acts tells us. We're in the end of the last days. We're in the last days. We've been in the last days since that day. So we got to learn. God's magnificent house in Acts 17, 24, is not a natural building at all. God, as the scriptures say, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's quoting out of Isaiah. God never intended to dwell in a man-made building. Do you understand that? When he did this in Solomon's temple, he never intended for that to be his dwelling place or Moses' tabernacle. <clears throat> In Hebrews 3, 6, Christ the Son over his own house, whose house are who? We are the house of God. We are the temple of God. That's what God was trying to teach us. How to be a magnificent house of God. Human beings, not mortar, but people. And so we see in 1 Peter 2, 5, you as living stones are built up a what? 
spiritual house, a spiritual temple. God is interested in people. And he wants us to be magnificent. Magnificent means excellent, superior. The church is supposed to be superior to every man-made ideal in this world. John chapter 15, verse 51. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. You think a church is built on a good worship leader or a good worship team or a good orator? <laughs> the church isn't built on that. Without Jesus, folks, we can't do anything. We need his glory to come. And it comes when it comes. It doesn't come because you believe it came. It, can't, it comes because it comes. And you know it. Hallelujah. See, Jesus is more important than the pastor, than the youth leader, than the church secretary, than the clerk. He's more important than anything. And without him, we're not going to excel. And that's what it says back there. The glory of the Lord filled the house. Jesus filled the house. John 7, 38, he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of life-giving water. This spoke he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Same statement in John 3, 16, he that believes on me shall not perish but have everlasting life. Same statement, he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow the Spirit of God, the presence of God out of our innermost being. So we are the temple as an individual as well as corporate. But if we don't allow Jesus to show up, we don't allow Jesus to express himself and fill our being, we miss out on his glory. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, who's the Holy Ghost? God, Jesus, they're all the same. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's all God. How many gods are there in Christianity? One God, okay? <laughs> he manifests himself in that fleshly body called Jesus, and you'll see that fleshly body when you go to heaven. But it's still God. The Holy Spirit is God. John 17, 3. This is eternal life. Now everybody thinks that eternal life is just living forever. But Jesus describes and gives us another definition of eternal life. This is eternal life that they may what? Know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now this word know is used in the Bible as a sexual relationship all through the Bible. Joseph did not know Mary till after Jesus was born. He didn't have sex with Mary till after Jesus was born. And we are to have an intimate relationship with God. He is to live in a, it's a real thing. It's not just head knowledge. It's not intellect. God wants you to be a magnificent temple and when we come together, he wants the body of Christ to be a magnificent church. Hallelujah. It's not about, the Bible's not a book of faith. It never says it's a book of faith. The Bible says it's a book of truth and the Bible says it is a book that leads you to God so you can know God and that is part of eternal life that you have a living real relationship with Jesus Christ. Music and singing are part of the New Testament pattern. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're not here to be entertained by music. We're here to entertain the Lord. To minister to him. He ordained music. He ordained singing. He ordained praise and worship. For us to minister to him. Does he need to be 
told how great he is? No. You need to hear yourself saying how great he is. He needs nothing. But he's given us principles. We need to remind ourselves how great he is and how thankful we should be. And when we sing unto him. Now, psalms are what they say. 150 psalms. We can sing them. They are songs and they are poems. All right? Hymns is scripture put together to make a song. Like how great thou art. See, that's a hymn. All right? Psalms 1 or Psalms 150, you know. And we can sing those and we should sing those. It's the living word. It's powerful. And a spiritual song Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when they that worship the Father must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. You see, when we transcend from the sacrifice, from the mechanics, to where the Spirit gets involved, that is when it becomes a spiritual song. It's Spirit ignited. And we need to make that transition. Hallelujah. And that's why we have a pause in between songs that people can lift up their song and sing and thank God their own personal self. That's why we do that. So you're not stuck with just chorus after chorus, but you have some time to sing and to praise and to thank your God as an individual. Hallelujah. Colossians 3.16 same thing, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let what dwell in you? The word of Christ. We need the word, we need the spirit, we need his presence, we need his word. Not man's word, his word. <clears throat> in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, giving thanks to God. Now a church, a good song service, will have a song that touches sinners because the church is supposed to have sinners in it. See, we're supposed to welcome them. I don't care what kind of sinner they are. But we need a song that they can relate to. The song service should also have an instructive song for babies. Babies have got to learn. And when you sing it, you never forget it. So if we teach them a song, they go away with substance in the instruction of the Lord. Are you with me? Hallelujah. <laughs> a song service should also have a high praise time. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. You see. And it should have an adoration time. And then in prayer, there should be prayer, uh, prayer song. Could that be true? Hallelujah. Whose house is it? His house. What do we do when the power is not active? You know, Moses went up to the mountain. God called him up to the mountain. God didn't do anything for seven days. And Moses just had to wait till God moved. On the day of Pentecost, before the day of Pentecost, God told him to go tarry in Jerusalem. They had to wait ten days before God moved. If you think that's something, from the last prophecy about Jesus and his coming as the Messiah, there was 400 years approximately before God did anything again. That's a long way. So what do you do when the power of God isn't... And, 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 and we can't manufacture, we can't act like, oh yeah, God is here. You can't, it's not by faith, it's when he comes, he comes. So what do you do? Hebrews 13, 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Isn't that what they did back in Solomon's temple? The magnifical house. They offered the praise and God came. He didn't come till they started praising and singing and worshiping him. That is the fruit of our lips. In case you don't know what he meant, he says it's the fruit of your lips. It's you humbling yourself and saying, praise God. Jesus is great. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the living word. He's the great I am. When you start praising him and thanking him, thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for your word. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my children. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That's the sacrifice that we're to give him. 
We're not to come into these doors all bummed out. Oh, man. We're to come in with praise and thanksgiving. It is a sacrifice. When you don't want to do it, it is a sacrifice, yes. But to do good and to communicate. Forget not, for such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And so, not only do we sing and praise Him and thank Him, but we do good. We live a good life. You may not want to do right. See, you may not like the restraints God put on, but you do it by sacrifice that is pleasing unto God. You treat your husband good. You treat your wife good. You treat your children good. You treat your mom and dad good. You treat your neighbor good. You live good and it's a sacrifice. And that guy down there at work that's a bully and he, and he drives you nuts, you treat him good. And it's a sacrifice. You want to punch him out. But you do good. That's a sacrifice. And this next one is very important. Communicate. Most of your translations have the wrong puny word there. Share. The NIV, the Amplified, all of them. The real word there is koinonia. Same word they used in Acts. When he told them to follow the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship, the karnania, the partnership, it's not just sharing. It is partnershiping, it's participating. You come to church to participate, to worship him, to praise him, to thank him, to love people, to hear from God. You are a participant. You don't come to hear some great speaker speak or to some mu great musician to play. You come to participate in the prayer, participate in the praise, participate. They continue in the apostles' doctrine and in the fellowship, the participation. And so many Christians do not participate. They won't praise God. They won't pray. They um, barely can get them to church. They don't get this. You may not want to go to church, but you it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that God asked you. You may not want to pray. It's a sacrifice that God asked you to do. And it's well pleasing to Him when you do it. And one day He will show up and you will touch God and know Him. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the magnificent church. Even when God isn't doing anything, they do what they're supposed to do. That's the magnificent church. Are you with me? The power of God. Not only is the power of His presence, the Spirit. <clears throat> Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power. The gospel is Jesus being prophesied to come, being born of a virgin, being baptized in the river of Jordan by John the Baptist, being driven into the wilderness for 40 days without any food or water, coming out and preaching with power and doing healings and miracles and teaching us the kingdom of God, laying down his life. No man could take it. He had to give it up. No man had the power. And then he picked it back up again. No man can pick his life back up again. That's a God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. And the gospel is what causes us to believe. I've told some young people a few months ago that I've never seen anyone saved through apologetics. I've never seen anyone saved arguing about creation with the atheists. And the evolutionists. Everyone I've seen saved responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword that separates the fleshly from the spiritual. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why we don't want a relationship with God. 
And we don't want a relationship with the gospel of Christ because we don't want him exposing our thinking, exposing our motives. So we go into human intellect. My wife sent me a tape this week of some guy saying that Genesis 1, like Bill O'Reilly, he thinks the Bible's just figurative and a metaphor. And I've written O'Reilly, and I, you're dead wrong here. A metaphor isn't in the Bible till God says it's a metaphor. The axe did swim. The whale did swallow Jonah. And God did create the earth in six days. Hallelujah. He's a supernatural God. And then they had the audacity to say that believing in evolution does not hinder our salvation. I said, sir, you're dead wrong. You guys are dead wrong. Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark said, in the beginning God created them, male and female. Jesus Christ, your Savior, Confirm that God created man, male and female. They didn't evolve from anything. They were created a man and a woman. Now if your Savior lied, he's not a Savior. Because the Savior had to be the perfect sacrifice. No sin in him. Yes, it affects your salvation. Are you there? Folks, we got to stick to the gospel. Yes, people will divide. Yes, people will separate from your company. But the power and the key to the magnificent house and, the, and, the, and revolutionizing the world is that we do it according to his pattern. And we need the power of his presence and we need the power of his word. Those two things is what makes the magnificent house. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Look at this. My speech, my preaching, was not with enticing words of men's intellect. Paul said, I didn't come to you with men's intellect. I don't know how the apostles did without Calvin and Wesley and St. Augustine. I just don't know how they ever survived without these quote unquote later Bible scholars that bore you to death when you read the writings but you read Paul and Peter and John's writing things come alive amen. Amen? amen but in demonstration in demonstration of the spirit and the power that your faith should not stand in the intellect of men. And this is what this man was doing. He was telling these young people, and there were a bunch of young people in this video, that their salvation had nothing to do with evolution and believing in evolution and, and that Genesis 1 was just a figurative, just a, a, a metaphor, you know, an illustration. It wasn't really real. That's the intellect of men. When you know him, eternal life we just read is to know him. When you know him, you know that's the intellect of men. When you don't know him, you're vulnerable to any kind of wind of doctrine coming around. Your face should not stand in the intellect of men, but in the what? Power of God. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. There is no other way. It's the preaching of the gospel. Jesus is the Savior. You can't take away from that. Hallelujah. And the magnificent church would not do that. Matthew 22, 9. You err, Jesus said. He talked to the religious people and said, you are in error, not knowing the scriptures. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And what did they do? They came to him with apologetics. Oh, well, uh, you know... Uh, this guy had uh, five wives. The first one died, second one died, third one died, fourth one died, you know. And finally he died. Now, teacher, whose wife? Is a, which one's his wife in heaven? 
You see, that's apologetics, a bunch of rhetoric nonsense. You understand me? And, and we do need apologetics, by the way, to help young believers understand some things. But you're not going to grow with apologetics, and you're not going to get saved by them. You're going to get saved by the gospel. You need to touch the power. Hallelujah. Jesus is the power. Luke 5, 17. The power of the Lord, that's the first power, the power of his presence. The power of the Lord was present to heal, and he healed the sick. You see, when he comes, folks, sick bodies can be healed. Miracles should be part of this day's church. It shouldn't be put back in some era that, well, that was back then and it stopped when the apostles died. That's a lie. That is a lie. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and how long? Forever. Just because God isn't doing anything doesn't mean he don't want to do anything and will do something. Did I say that right? Sometimes you just got to wait. When I got healed of valley fever, it was six months later. Six months later. I went in in April and I was dying. They told me, man, you're in trouble. This stuff is going to get into your bones, going to go to your brain and you're a dead man. When I went back, that doctor says it's gone. Took God six months. I didn't complain. I'm just glad it happened. <laughs> and that doctor, he's a Presbyterian. He says, I've seen this before. You got a miracle. He said, I've seen this several times. That's after I told him I didn't take the medicine they gave me. The medicine would, could kill me, mess up my nervous system, destroy my kidney, uh, you know. And so I thought, I'm going to wait another month. <laughs> If I'm going to die, uh, <laughs> this medicine looks like it's going to help me die. <laughs> but you see, it happens when it happens. And my wife was glad that God finally showed up. <laughs> she, she didn't want to raise these kids by herself. She wanted that man around. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 18, all authority, all power has been given, Jesus said, unto me in heaven and in earth. How much power? All of it. Folks, without him, we can't do anything and we need to do what brings him. And we need to learn how to release him and let him be active in a church service. Do you agree? It may be new to us. I've seen tremendous things in God because I availed myself. I made myself available. A magnificent church has, number one, the power of his presence, and number two, the power of the living word. And this is a mistake that we made in Pentecost and charismatic areas. We like to feel good from the presence. But if we didn't let the word come and can back it up and direct us. And it's the word that brings balance. It's the word that, that, that keeps us solid. 